This is chapter three. I, the more I get into this book, the more I see, you know, this is a lot like physiological psych without any of the any of the science. <laughs> they're talking about they're talking about concepts, and uh, you know, it, it makes a lot of sense. I've been teaching teaching this stuff for a long time, so it, it's I'm. When I first started teaching this class, I, I wasn't exactly sure if I could do it, but uh, getting into it deeper and deeper, I can see that um, it's it's all the same stuff. It's just looking at it from a different perspective. Um, the thing that surprises me, and, and uh, I've been doing this for 30 years, one of the things that surprises me is that I've never met a, a cognitive psychologist that worked in physiological psych or even taught physiological psych or even wanted to discuss physiological psych. That's the part that, that is a little surprising to me. I can remember when I first came to Diné College, um, Psych 255 needed to be taught and there was, you know, she was right there. The co our cognitive psychologist was right there, but she didn't want to have anything to do with it. She didn't want to talk about it. She didn't want to have anything to do with it. And it was the same way back at Ashford. Uh, their cognitive psychologist was my next door neighbor. And, uh, you know, all the classes came up and, and he, he took, uh, he took, uh, classes in, uh, or he took the classes in research methods and statistics, but he didn't want to touch anything that had to do with, with real science. Now, the interesting thing about cognitive psychology is that the there's the American Psychological Association that, that looks at what they look at, you know they look at practically everything, and then cognitive psychologists don't want to be members of the APA. They're members of the APS, the American Psychological Science uh, Society or something, APS. Anyway, and and they don't get they won't read journals from APA. <laughs> it's really kind of kind of interesting, but let's not worry about that aspect. This is really kind of interesting, and, and this really teaches us um, how we look at things. Uh, so today we're going to talk about attention. Um, and I hope these guys are paying attention. Uh, since they're up on a girder, it looks like uh, several hundred stories above the, uh, above the ground. Um, so the first thing we're going to talk about is change blindness. Change blindness is a perceptual phenomenon that occurs when a change is a, in a visual stimulus is introduced and the observer does not notice it. They don't see the change. Uh, this is how magic tricks are done. Um, this is how you miss things. Um, you know, I, driving down the road and, and my wife says, did you see that goose on the side of the road? And, and I would say, no, I didn't see it because I was concentrating on something else. Normally I see movement, but sometimes I don't. I have run into deer that I didn't uh, detect uh, movement from uh, my, my left. I can remember like it was yesterday. <laughs> A deer came from my left. This was, the, this was uh, New Year's Eve. We were going over to my daughter's house. And there was movement to the left, and it was brown, and, you know, there was, uh, there was uh, two feet of snow on the ground, and he was jumping over the, the snow drifts, and I didn't catch him, and I, I hit him with the, the left front uh, part of the uh, car, took out the headlight. I actually didn't take out the headlight, just took out the fender. Anyway, I didn't see him. I didn't see, I didn't detect him. Brown on white, didn't detect it. Movement, uh uh, in a, in a uh, otherwise uh, still uh, scenario landscape, and uh, I didn't pick him up. My wife did. She saw him before, before I hit him. For example, ob observers often fail to notice major differences introduced into an image while it flickers off and on again. Uh, people's poor ability to detect changes have been argued to reflect fundamental limitations of human attention. Change blindness has become a highly researched topic, and some have argued that it may have important practical implications in areas such as eyewitness testimony and distractions while driving. We run into things sometimes when we're driving. We don't notice that the guy in front of us, especially if his brake lights are off, has stopped. 
because we're uh, we're used to seeing uh, brake lights uh, if somebody uh, stops. We're used to seeing those bright red lights in front of us. Well, if his brake lights are out, you've got a problem because he's going. He may stop, and you may not detect it uh, because there's something that's not normal. You know, we're we're on automatic pilot, and actually, we're going to talk about automatic thinking, uh, automatic attention in just a second. Uh, there are actually it's at the end of the chapter. There are numerous very powerful demonstrations of change blindness. Essentially, major changes can be made to an image without a viewer realizing it because we are only consciously aware of the subset of the potentially available information in the image at any one time. All that is necessary for change blindness to occur is that there is some interruption to viewing the image. If you if you uh, read the book, if you've read the book uh, already, uh, then you then you did the card trick at the at the beginning. And by golly, it, it took me two times before I figured out how it was done. <laughs> but it had to do with change blindness. I, it was the fact that uh, that the cards that they showed you at the front were not exactly the same as the cards that they showed you at the back. So if they uh, it would be impossible for your card to be there um, because they were different cards. Uh, instead of the uh, seven of, of uh, diamonds, they had the seven of hearts. And you didn't notice it because it was red. Uh, they had the uh, five of clubs and they had the five of diamond, or the five of clubs and the five of spades at the back. So you didn't notice. I didn't notice. It took me two times before I figured out what, how, how they did it. Not only is our vision interrupted when we blink, but it is also interrupted every time we move our eyes to bring the fovea, the high acuity region of the eye, to bear on the objects or areas of interest. In normal viewing, our eyes make sh several short rapid eye movements between fixation points each second. These eye movements are referred to as saccades and can be, uh, uh, can be reflex, for example, uh, to sudden appearance of a visual stimulus, or voluntary. Uh, so we may do it because we're looking at something, or we may do it because it's just reflex. If something, if something new comes in, our, our uh, vision is suddenly uh, tuned to whatever is happening, and that's, that's a reflex action. The duration of a saccade is uh, determined by the speed and distance covered by the saccade, but is usually not more than about 100 milliseconds. 100 milliseconds uh, is really fast. And this is what, uh, if, we, if we look at this, uh, this lady's eye, that's what a saccade looks like. So if we look at everybody's eyes, I mean, if you look into somebody's eyes, this is exactly what you'll see. You'll see the eye moving, mo moving uh, several times a second, as bizarre as that may seem. And here, this is a saccade as well. Once a saccade has been uh, completed, the visual input can be quite different to, to pre-saccade. During the saccade, vision is suppressed and we are functionally blind. This is why we can uh, never see your own eye movement in a mirror. And we've known this for a long time. We've known this since I started in psychology in 1975. Such visual suppression helps to maintain visual co continuity. Your visual experience is one of seamless com comprehension of the visual world, and this is according to Grimes in 1996, rather than an image lurching like a really bad phone video. I mean, this is what our eyes are doing, but that's not what we see. We see continuity. We see, we see a picture, even though our, our eyes are flipping back and forth. Not a little bit, anyway. Like that. That's a saccade. Those are all saccades. And you can see that they're tracking it every time her eye moves. I assume it's a her, since she has such long eyelashes. That's a guy. That's a guy. I assume it's a male because his heavy eyebrows. Okay. Change blindness helps to maintain a stable and coherent worldview. 
It also means we are less likely to spot continuity errors, errors in films where, for example, a coffee cup visible in one scene has disappeared in the next, or vice versa. This is a famous, this is from a famous experiment by Simons and Levin. Um, they had, wait a minute, let's go to the beginning. There we go. This guy is asking for directions. This guy's giving him directions. They interrupt, and he leaves, and the guy's even got a different color coat on. This is brown, and the other one is green. But he doesn't notice uh, change blindness. They've changed people on him. They've kind of got the same haircut. Uh, not quite. Got the same map, of course. Yeah, see, this guy's color is even different. But this guy doesn't notice because, because of change blindness. And that's the Simons and Levin experiment of 1998. Uh, Kahneman in 1973 proposed the idea of human cognition in incorporating a simple processor allocating uh, limited resources to different aspects of the world. One of the things I need to tell you, and, and I probably should have mentioned this at the beginning of the year, but uh, they, this is, um, our textbooks are from uh, Routledge. Routledge. Uh, and Routledge is an English uh, company. Um, when I asked them for supplemental material, they didn't have any because that's not the way they do things in England. Uh, but the, the kicker is that uh, their sentences are put together like English, like the English put together sentences, and their spell spelling is the same. Now, normally I correct the English spelling for American spelling so you won't get confused. They put a U in color. Uh, what else do they do? Uh, they use uh, S's instead of Z's, so if you see a Z in the word, uh, it's probably an American word because it's the American spelling because the Brits don't use Z's hardly at all. They don't even call them Z's, they call them Z's. Okay, so if, uh, if you think that the uh, sentence structure is a little off, uh, then it probably is because it's, uh, it's not, uh, the textbook isn't from the United States. From England. Why they gave me an English textbook, I'm not exactly sure. I'm sure they have American textbooks. <laughs> Maybe they don't. Uh, so if you have some really strange spelling in your textbook, I apologize. It's because it's English. It's from England. So should that make any difference as far as cognitive psychology is concerned? No, it shouldn't. Uh, all, all of the information is probably pretty close to the same. Um, we know that Europeans have focused on different aspects of psychology uh, at different times uh, than, than people in the United States. Uh, but as far as cognitive psychology is concerned, it started off in the United States. There have been some very famous uh, English uh, cognitive psychologists. Um, so, yeah, the, the, the two ideas kind of mix together, and, and we don't have to uh, worry that uh, I'm giving you information that uh, you shouldn't, uh, that you won't be able to use because when you go off to graduate school, you'll be saying, oh, wait a minute, uh, Bradway said this, uh, and they'll say, well, that's the way the English see things. It's, that's not the way it usually works in cognitive psychology as far as, I'm, as far as I know. Anyway, okay, so we're still talking about change blindness. Uh, Kahneman proposed the idea of human cognition incorporating a central processor allocating limited resources to different aspects of the world. There are insufficient resources available to process everything, so some things will not be processed, at least not fully. That is, we do not attend to everything. Uh, Kahneman in 2011 um, makes the point that uh, the phrase paying attention is very apt. Uh, we have limited cognitive resources just as most of us have limited money. We cannot pay attention to everything. Normally, we pay attention to what we see. Uh, and this is known as visual capture. Uh, we don't, uh, or we may be uh, listening to music and uh, not paying attention to what, what uh, we smell. This was, a, this was one of the things that they were afraid of when uh, they first put, started putting radios in cars. They were afraid that uh, the driver would be listening to music and not paying attention to the road. Um, and maybe in the beginning it did. I don't know. 
some uh, cars have uh, what you can get your text messages uh, on the uh, on the screen just to the right of the, stir of the steering wheel. Um, reading and driving at the same time, probably not the best idea. I knew somebody that, that could do it, uh, but most people can't. I've tried it before. Uh, not the smartest thing I've ever done. Uh, but uh, yeah, you, some people can do it. Actually, they're, and we're going to talk about this. They're not really paying attention to one thing, uh, paying attention to two things at the same time. You can't do that. Uh, you can only pay attention to one thing at a time. But they're shifting back and forth fairly rapidly. And that's, that's how it's done. Uh, how do we allocate attention if we cannot process all the information potentially available to us? Uh, one of the simplest ways of reducing the processing uh, load is to direct attention to a restricted region of space. Being able to allocate attention to a region of space is useful if there are no objects or features visible. For example, it may be dark, uh, so you're watching your headlights. Uh, hopefully, the area that you are uh, paying the most attention to as you're driving, even though you're listening to a conversation, even though you're listening to music, you're still not really, you're still, uh, your attention is mostly on the road. Considering attention as an evolved system, uh, then it is worth considering the potential survival benefits of being able to allocate attention to a region of space, either to search for objects or to be ready when something appears, does appear in that region. Stimuli that fall outside our attentional spotlight receive less or no processing. The implication, of course, is that the more widely you spread your spotlight of attention, the more thinly spread your processing resources are. Now, I skipped a whole page uh, talking about spotlights, uh, but the, what you really need to know is it's like a spotlight. So while the spotlight is on, there, all this material is still there, but what you're focusing on is what's in the spotlight, and that's known as spotlight of attention. Uh, so we have spotlight of attention. If we're, we're eating a, um, uh, something that we think is rotten, uh, then our taste buds are our spotlight of attention. Uh, if we're listening to uh, a, a, watching a television show and we're listening to uh, the dialogue, uh, then our attention is probably on the... Uh, on what we see, but a lot of times it's it, it's on what we hear. Uh, my wife and I watch a lot of English uh, shows from England, and because the English have a, a strange accent, uh, it's sometimes difficult to understand what they say. Uh, we were watching oh, we're, we're, oh, uh, Stranger Things the other day. Uh, we had, we hadn't watched it before. This is we're binge watching it. I guess we watch two or three episodes a night uh, on some nights. Uh, but anyway, we were watching Stranger episodes, and sometimes they say things under their breath. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, I used to watch, uh, my favorite cartoons were Popeye cartoons. I loved Pop Popeye. Um, I wanted to be Popeye, except I didn't want a tattoo. Uh, I thought he was really cool. A little guy that, uh, that uh, can eat spinach, and then uh, he becomes a Superman. That's kind of cool. Can't argue with that. But Popeye, if you watch him, uh, you can see the action, uh, you can hear what he says when he's speaking to somebody else. But a lot of times he speaks under his breath. And I can remember the day that I realized that, that the funniest parts were him speaking under his breath. Uh, and that's where all the jokes were in, uh, in that part. But I wasn't even, you know, I was watching the colors, uh, I was listening to. Uh, what he was saying, I was watching the action. But I wasn't listening to him speaking under his breath. And uh, that's the funniest part in Papa. I even liked him better after, after that. Uh, Huderman et al. in 2014 have demonstrated that experts in sports that benefit from horizontal distribution of attention, such as football, show a differently shaped spotlight to those experts in vertical sports, such as volleyball. This finding demonstrates that the spotlight of attention is not fixed, but can be modified by experience. And, of course, if we're watching this, uh, this running play by Texas, I can't, I'm not sure who they're playing. Anyway, we can see that 
if you're on the field at this time, you're watching everything from left to right. You're watching everything from front to back. It's, it's all horizontal. Every, everything's taking place in the horizontal. However, volleyball is, is a game that happens in the vertical. Um, there are passes that are horizontal, but mo almost everything is up in the air. So your focus, your attention has to be on things coming down uh, and, and things that you have to hit. Or tap up or something. Or block. It's a vertical game. So volleyball is a vertical game. And football is a horizontal game except for the passing game. And even the passing game, the, the ball doesn't really go up that high. Uh, so your your attention is probably, even if you're a defensive back, it's not it doesn't go up very high. Uh, not only that, but you have to keep your eye on uh, the individual coming down the field, the receiver coming down the field that you're supposed to, to stay on. Uh, so that's that's very uh, horizontal. Anyway, so volleyball is a, a vertical sport, a focus where the focus is uh, on. Uh, Things happening uh, in the up and down, and football is a horizontal sport. Uh, it's interesting. I don't know if you have cats or if you've ever had a cat, but if you drop something in front of a cat, they won't see it. They won't even notice it. It's because uh, the cat's visual field is uh, is horizontal. It's extremely horizontal. They catch mice. Even birds are flying uh, across their field. Uh, they rarely look up. As a matter of fact, their heads barely don't move that way. They don't, they don't move the up, up and down very well. Uh, their, their necks. As curious as that is. So horizontal and vertical attention. And I was just thinking about this. If I were a uh, football coach and I uh, was coaching the uh, defensive backs, uh, maybe I would uh, try to change their focus a little bit more vertical. Uh, so that uh, maybe maybe uh, practice sometimes playing volleyball. Um, I don't know if you've ever been around men trying to play volleyball. I mean, uh, young ladies, I, you know, I've played on, on uh, uh, co-ed volleyball teams, and the, the, uh, the females were much, much better at it than the males were. And it's because it's a vertical sport, and most male sports are horizontal sports. Um, so I was just thinking, if you're a, a uh, coach of the the, uh, the back defensive backfield, uh, that potentially having them play volleyball might not be a bad idea. It will it will refocus them on the on the vertical rather than the horizontal. Duel Mel et al. in 1992 suggested that shifts in attention may anticipate eye movements. The spotlight uh, moves before the eyes do. As the eyes move, the attentional spotlight may actually split it into two, with one beam moving to the new location and one staying behind at the old location and catching up later. Kind of like this lady has to catch up. Early selection is selective attention that operates on the physical uh, information available from, from early perceptual analysis. This is how magicians perform sleight of hand by suggesting that you keep your eye on something other than the target. All perception does this as you attune your hearing to your child's voice, your sight to movement, your taste to something salty, your nose to pleasant smells. Uh, so when you open a package of, uh, of Cheetos, um, you start uh, anticipating tasting the cheesy salt, salty taste of the Cheetos. Uh, so you have become attuned to that, and that has to do with early selection. You're thinking, this is going to be salty. Um, you do the same thing with, uh, with a drink. If you open a, a, a Coke, uh, you're thinking, this is going to be sweet. So when you taste it, you taste exactly what you thought you were going to taste. And sometimes, even if it doesn't taste the same, you still taste it that way. Because that's what you've anticipated. And this is known as early selection. A striking example of an allocation of attention to a feature in the visual domain is provided by the phenomenon of attention of pop-out. And this is according to Treisman. Treisman's kind of interesting. Uh, she was a, a, a lady. Her name is Anne Treisman. Uh, she did a lot of uh, work in the 
cognitive psychology field, and then Wolf in 1994. If a particular stimulus has a unique feature, why did I mention Ann Treisman? Uh, because a lot of uh, scientists uh, are male, I guess, and uh, I, I was quite impressed with Ann, uh, the, the fact that Ann Treisman uh, was in this chapter over and over and over again. She did uh, an amazing amount of work between the 1970s, early 1970s, and the, uh, and the 2010s. If a particular stimulus has a unique feature, such as a color or a shape, uh, which is not shared by the stimuli around it, then it will automatically draw attention and pop out. And that's what's happening with the blue dot. Uh, if you look at these dots, they're all dots, but one's blue and the rest of them are red. So it pops out. Attention is more than just a process of directing, uh, directing processing resources to particular features. In feature integration theory, Treisman and Gillade in 1980, uh, attention is conceptualized as a cognitive glue that binds the features that make up a single object together. Different uh, sensory features, color, line orientation, etc., are coded by specialized independent subsystems or modules, and each module forms a feature map uh, for the dimensions of the feature it encodes, plotting the locations of that feature. Uh, so feature integration has to do with the fact that when we look at something, we see the, the general features of what we're looking at, and then we see specifics. So if we looked at, at this uh, group of uh, figures right here, uh, the feature would be the fact that they're all, they're all O's. Uh, later, of course, we'll pick out the fact that one of them is green. Uh, these are all green. That's the first feature that we see. That's the feature that we see. And then, of course, we see the O. Uh, when we look at this, we see they're, they're all green, uh, but there are half of them are X's and, and more of them are T's. Uh, the T's are darker. I, I'm not sure what color that is, but there's a, a lighter green T. And, of course, we wouldn't notice that until we had identified the features first. Uh, this one, of course, is the same situation. Uh, it's, uh, we have red ends and, and green uh, zeros, O's, uh, but we have one red zero. That's what we would have noticed eventually. But the first thing that we see is their features. It's easier to see the features here. These are all O's. Most, these are mostly N's. Uh, these are both T's and X's. Uh, these are N's and, and O's. So the feature here is, is green. Uh, the feature here is nothing. There's really, uh, there's, there, there are two features that we notice, the red ends and the, the green O's. And then of course, there is a red O. So we see thing in fe things in features, feature integration theory. <clears throat> Conjunction is a term uh, from feature integration theory of attention that describes a target defined by at least two separate features, such as an, a red O amongst a green O's and uh, red T's. Uh, when a conjunction or binding of features is required, then the separate features must be combined. For example, a red line of a certain orientation. And this com combining of features requires focused attention. Now, when we look at this, uh, what do we see? Well, we there's no there, there's a line of green X's. Uh, we're trying we're trying to make sense of this, um, and that's what where conjunction comes in. So we see the line of, of green X's. Uh, the T's are all over the place. Uh, so the the features uh, are X's, uh, green X's and red T's. Uh, but we're trying to make sense out of it, and that's what conjunction is all about. Conjunction is making, is, is binding the picture together, binding the scenes together. So if we uh, looked outside and we saw a rabbit in our garden, uh, the features would be the rabbit and the garden and the, uh, the binding or the conjunction would be he's probably eating vegetables out of our garden. That's the binding of why the rabbit is in the garden. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> a conjunction of features to form uh, an object can be achieved in three ways. 
First, features that have been encoded on the feature maps may fit into predicted uh, object frames according to stored knowledge, and this is top-down influences. We know that rabbits eat vegetables. We know that there are vegetables in the garden. And this is these. This is top down. This is what we know. Rabbits and rabbits eat vegetables. Uh, rabbits in the garden. Uh, garden has has vegetables. So we're putting them in those separate frames. For example, we know that fire engines are red and the sky is blue. So if the, the colors red and blue are active at the same time, we're unlikely to combine red with sky and blue with fire engine. And of course. I picked out two pictures. One uh, has a, a blue fire engine, and the other has a red sky. This is because of a fire, of course. Uh, so if uh, uh, so this doesn't fit, I, it, you know, the blue fire engine and the red sky really doesn't fit because it doesn't fit in the, the proper frame. Second, attention may select uh, within a master map of locations that allows all the features at the particular location to be gathered together corresponding to the Gestalt principle of proximity as a way of grouping features into an object. When attention is focused on one location in the master map, it allows for retrieval of all the features present at that location and creates a temporary representation of the combination of those features in an object file. The contents of the object file are then used to recognize the object by matching it to stored knowledge in, in memory. The, uh, Treisman, Treisman, I'm sorry, Treisman, assume, in 1988 assumed that conscious perception depends on matching the contents of the object file with stored descriptions in long-term memory, allowing recognition. So if we look at, look at this, do we see a rectangle of, of objects? And the answer is probably yes. Five, uh, five of them are balls, and one of them is a triangle. So we see a, a rectangle of balls with a triangle in the corner. Uh, this is uh, what we see a square of, uh, of balls and with two triangles, one in the middle and one at one corner. But we probably still see, we see this as a rectangle, and we see this as a square. A square made up of, of black circles. And these are just anomalies. That's the way we probably see it. And that's because of our master map. We're looking for structures. And this structure is a rectangle, and this structure is a square. Third, features may combine uh, on their own without attention. But sometimes this conjunction may be inaccurate and give rise to an illusory conjunction. Uh, yes. For example, if searching a display of different colored shapes that contains a green square and a red triangle, an individual may erroneously report a red square. And here we have a red square. But mo almost all these squares are green except for one. And of course, we see red, lots of red triangles and three, four, five, six, uh, six green, seven, seven green triangles. I'm still picking them out. There's two, four, five, seven, eight, nine, nine, nine tri green triangles. How many red ones are there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So there's twelve uh, red triangles and there's nine uh, green triangles. Uh, do we do we see any conjunction here? No, there's no no real connection here. There's no lines. There's they're just kind of randomly thrown up there. Objects do, however, uh, and of course, what we're trying to do is we're trying to make sense of whatever we're looking at. And as far as this is concerned, what was I trying to do? I was trying to make the green triangles an anomaly. We so we have mostly red triangles, and we do. Uh, but we have an awful lot of green triangles. Why in the world didn't I focus on the green triangles? Because there's more red triangles. Objects do, however, have attention-getting properties above and beyond simply occupying a region of space and being a collection of features. If we look at this over here, what do we see? Do we see uh, a big X? Uh, or do we see two Vs? And the answer is... We can see them both, but probably we saw the X first, and then we saw the V's. Actually, there's four V's, aren't there? 
There's a blue one, a red one, a red and blue one, and a blue and red one. Okay. Chin in 2012 points out the, that objects can be can overlap and share a region of space, and yet we are still able to attend to each particular object. Once an object is identified, then any constituent uh, parts of that object are more easily processed than parts of a different but overlapping object. And this is according to Duncan in 1984. And it is uh, generally uh, faster to uh, shift attention within as compared to between objects. For example, Chin used an ingenious paradigm to demonstrate the operation of object-based uh, attention using stimuli like the one shown at the left. And of course, if the first thing that we saw was a big X, then that's exactly what Chin wanted us to see. But then if he told us, well, do you see the Vs? Then all of a sudden we saw a red V and a, and a blue V. And uh, to tell you the truth, when I first put this lecture together, when I first uh, found this picture, I didn't even think of the, of the red and blue uh, legged Vs. Uh, but there's four Vs in that picture instead of the two that I was seeing before. According to Duncan in 1996, attention is allocated according to a biased competition. All aspects of a situation compete for attention, and brighter, larger, or moving objects are most likely to win that competition. Attention will therefore be allocated to the loudest noise of the brightest light. Pruel and uh, Egeth in 2008 demonstrated that brighter, larger objects do indeed tend to capture attention at the expense of dimmer, smaller objects. And despite the fact that this black uh, swan is uh, maybe a little bit smaller than some of the other swans, it's what we see first. First of all, it's in the middle of the field. And second of all, it's unique. Now you may ask yourself the question, why in the world didn't I, did my wife see that, uh, that deer that I hit on New Year's Eve three or four years ago? Why did she see it and I didn't see it? Uh, the one thing that you uh, that I didn't mention was the fact that it was snow. It, we had about two feet of snow, uh, and the the road was was slick, and I was going downhill. Uh, so I was concentrating on keeping the car on the road, uh, not slipping uh, or sliding. I had a four wheel drive vehicle, but you know you're going downhill. You really don't have complete control over it. So I was concentrating on not going off the road. I probably I would have gone into the ditch. Both there were there were extreme ditches on one side. Actually, there were extreme ditches on both sides. Um, in Iowa, a lot of the uh, uh, ditches on the sides of roads are fairly extremes. Uh, they use them as irrigation. They can use them. Uh, as runoff and irrigation ditches. Uh, so the uh, gravel road right outside my house uh, that I have to drive on to get to the, uh, the paved road, uh, we have about an eight foot deep ditch on both sides. And when it rains, uh, sometimes those ditches fill up completely. Um, and on the, the uh, paved road uh, that, we, that we drive on, it's, uh, it has eight to 10 foot deep ditches as well on each side of the road. Okay, so <clears throat> bias competition and attention capture, what captures our attention? Uh, movement, bright lights, uh, something being larger than, than something else. I was watching The Hobbit last night and every time a troll came up who was, you know, three or four times the size of, of all the other fighting animals or creatures or whatever, hobbits and men and elves and dwarves and orcs, um, you, you, uh, your attention was drawn to that, that figure. Capturing of attention may, excuse me, the capturing of attention by perceptually salient uh, stimuli is essential in essentially an exogenous process. Uh, yeah, for example, uh, eternal, uh, extra, I'm sorry, external to the individual. It is the properties of elements of, of the situation that capture attention. With the most salient uh, winning the competition for attention at the expense of other less uh, salient stimuli. 
For example, if a stimulus in a visual field, such as a bright light, is being attended to, there is evidence that the activity of the cells in the visual cortex representing other elements of the visual scene is suppressed. And that's according to Duncan and Humphreys, 1989, Desimone and Duncan in 1995, and Reynolds et al. in 1999. This competition provides an efficient way to allocate attention. Uh, one of the problems that sometimes I have, uh, I don't go to the city very often, but when I do go to the city, a lot of times um, the bright lights on the side of the road trying to, at night, the bright lights on the side of the road trying to get your attention, trying to get you to buy uh, uh, Domino's Pizza or uh, McDonald's or whatever, uh, especially if they're flashing lights, sometimes I have a difficult time picking out street lights from all of the bright lights on the side of the road. Uh, this can be a problem if you're if you're seeing all bright lights as advertisements rather than uh, traffic signals. Um, then potentially you're going to miss a traffic signal and go right through a stoplight or something. Uh, from an evolutionary point of view, more intentionally salient stimuli are likely to be generated by things such as the saber-toothed tigers that are closer or bigger and are more likely to pose an imminent threat or require immediate action. And of course, that's what we should always be looking for. We should always be looking for the most salient threat to us. Danger, danger, Will Robinson. Using a simple competition as the basis for allocating attention seems quite efficient but it has some obvious drawbacks. One drawback is that once attention has been allocated to something, it could be difficult to switch attention to something else, less salient, unless the original stimulus disappears. A second drawback is that if you do manage to allocate attention to a second, less salient stimulus, the original stimulus is likely to win the competition again and grab attention back. So what is, the, is, is to stop humans acting like a moth around a flame, constantly fixated on the brightest light or the loudest noise in any situation? And of course, this is a picture of a puppy monkey baby leading two men. What are they drinking? Oh, they're drinking some kind of Mountain Dew. I can't remember what kind it is. The dumbest commercial ever made. Puppy monkey baby. The three cutest things in the world. Three awesome things combined. Puppy monkey baby. Uh, and they're dancing. Okay. There is evidence that humans can, under some circumstances, exhibit what has become known as a moth to the flame effect when there is very strong visual cues to grab attention. Studies have suggested that drivers tend to steer in the direction of where they fixate. If there is a strong visual stimulus like bright flashing red lights, it is quite likely that the drivers would look and attend to the lights. Redinger et al. in 2002 have demonstrated that the moth to the flame effect in drivers is likely to be a cognitive effect. In other words, if you're focusing on it and you're thinking about it, uh, then you will respond uh, to the brightest light and the most, uh, the brightest light, which would be the flashing light. That's why if you're not paying attention to your driving and the guy in front of you hits his brakes and you've got that sudden fl flash of red light, you will attend to it. Given that it is unusual to see drivers circling bright light sources such as street lights, there must be some way of breaking the attentional pull of a stimulus, and there is. Corbetta and Schulman in 2002 identified a ventral frontal parietal brain network that acts as a circuit breaker to break attentional focus on one stimulus in favor of another behaviorally relevant stimulus. And this is the area that we're talking about, this brown area right here. Another feature of a human attentional system that acts to prevent individuals getting stuck on one stimulus is a feature that has been labeled as inhibition of return. As already discussed, when attention is allocated to a stimulus, that stimulus is preferentially processed at the expense of distractors. But once attention has disengaged from such a stimulus, there is inhibition of return and there is a delay in responding to subsequent stimuli at that location. 
A similar phenomenon is that if two stimuli are, present, are presented in rapid succession, the second one may be missed. This is termed an attention of blank. And this is, that's what this is an example of. Uh, they show you all these pictures really, really fast. And what they want you to attend to is the wedding party. Um, once they tell you that you need to attend to the wedding party, it's easy to see the bride's uh, flowing uh, dress that goes all the way to the ground. And to attend to that. But the first time you saw it, did you see the bride? That's the question. And this is an actual experiment by Brogdon. Brogdon. Uh, it's interesting as that is. But then they'd ask you a question like, did you see the iguana? <clears throat> So sometimes you know, that's an attention of blank if you miss the next picture. You just see the bridge, you know, that kind of thing. Thus far, attention has been considered as a bottoms-up, stimulus-driven process. There are, however, clear top-down influences resulting from knowledge, expectancies, and intentions. If we are searching for a particular feature, such as the color of somebody's coat, then prioritizing that particular feature, their color, is a top-down process. The competition for attention has been biased by the top-down influences, which color we decide to, to look for. It has been suggested by Cruz in 2010 that top-down influences moderate the spread of attention in spotlight. And of course, if we're looking for uh, somebody's red coat rather than everybody's blue coat, everybody seems to have one dark, except for Kate Middleton here. Oh, we're looking for somebody with white pants. And it's this lady over here. And, uh, Posner, in 1980, interpolated his research as evidence for two attention systems. Firstly, an endogenous system, which can be controlled intentionally by subjects' task, uh, by subjects task goals and is used to direct attention in the central queuing condition. Secondly, an exogenous system, which is not under intentional control, and that automatically draws attention to the location of a change in the visual environment, whether a cue is valid or not. So we have an exogenous system and an endogenous system. And as we saw in this figure, here is the endogenous system right here, and here is the exogenous system right here. Ventral frontal cortex. There you go. This is the exogenous system, and this is the endogenous, endogenous system. It has been suggested by Owl et al. in 2012 and Tooze in 2019 that there is a third attentional uh, system driven by selection history. If you have attended to something previously, you're more likely to attend to it again. Whether this can, uh, constitutes a separate system or could be integrated back into the endogenous system by considering knowledge to be an endogenous influence is an interesting question. It is clear that there are a wide range of influences that could be considered to be endogenous, such as emotion, that can bias the allocation of attention. Now, these are the kinds of arguments I try to keep out of here. The idea that there's this third uh, attention system. Is that right? Well, some people argue, no, it's just, in a, it's just part of the endogenous system. These are, these are issues that, uh, that cognitive psychologists get into all the time. Uh, somebody will say there's a third system. Uh, the, old, the old folks will say, no, 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 no. no. It's, it's part of the endogenous system. It's not, it's not separate at all. And then, of course, somebody will do a uh, functional MRI PET scan, and they will see that it's a different area of the brain that's activated. Anyway, we won't worry about whether there's a third system or not. We'll just identify the two, uh, the endogenous and the exogenous system for now, because those are the ones that we saw, and those are the ones that we uh, have been identified uh, in brain scans.
A more real-world example of the phenomenon investigated by Treisman is the own name effect. Uh, this is an old, old idea, Murray in 1959 and Wood and Cowan in 1995, whereby humans will often pick up on their own name in a message which they are not attending to. And that's Maya Karjan et al. in 2019. Our own name has particular meaning for us, and so it can bias the allocation of attention if our name is spoken within earshot, even in a conversation to which we are not currently attending. And here's this lady sitting at the table, and she hears uh, somebody saying, Amy, and it's music to her ear. So she starts paying attention to whatever it is that these people are talking about, because they may be talking about her. A really interesting situation. I was at a soccer tournament when I was in the service. I was at a soccer tournament in Amarillo, Texas. And uh, before the tournament, uh, they had a huge get-together in this great big room. <clears throat> and we had this one guy on our team. He was <laughs> he was a pilot, and he was a good soccer player. That wasn't the that wasn't the interesting thing about him. Evidently, he was a good pilot too. That wasn't that wasn't uh, the interesting thing. But he loved himself. He loved himself so much. <laughs> he was. He would speak about himself in the third person. So he'd talk about, you know, Brian Adams, Brian Adams, Brian Adams, because that was his name, of course. Uh, so it was really kind of interesting. Uh, you would, uh, and I like to talk to, to Brian. He was, he was kind of a fun guy. So we're at this part, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm really not very good at parties because I don't drink and I'm boring, you know, the whole thing. Uh, so here we are, we're just kind of sitting around, and I'm talking to this other guy, and all of a sudden I hear, Brian Adams, scream, somebody screamed it out. And uh, I was thinking, well, where's Brian? He was just here a minute ago. Somebody's yelling for him. And so, <laughs> and so about two minutes later, we heard it again, Brian Adams. And what, what was happening, he was yelling his own name for some reason. He had, was having some kind of a conversation where he was yelling his own name. Uh, but of course, everybody in the, new, in the room found out who Brian Adams was because somebody kept yelling it. Anyway, and we noticed it, of course, because it was somebody that we knew. And once we figured out it was Brian Adams yelling his own name, it was really kind of interesting. But if we were at a party and all of a sudden we heard somebody say our, our name, we would start paying attention to that. And that's known as the own name effect. The influence of top-down processing on attention is also evident in the well-known cocktail party phenomenon, whereby an individual is able to follow the speech of a single speaker in the midst of a number of other concurrent conversations. This does not only occur at cocktail parties, but demonstrates that humans are able to use both low-level exogenous cues, the tone of voice, the position of the speaker, and higher level endogenous cues to follow a single speaker. And this is known as the cocktail party phenomenon. Uh, so uh, you're able to distinguish uh, voices uh, because that's who you're listening to. And, uh, okay, cocktail parties. This is what cocktail parties teach us. Most people who are, uh, who multitask are actually switching their attention between tasks rapidly. You can't, you can only pay attention to one thing at a time, no matter what, you know, you can't, mul there is no such thing as multitasking. It's you switching your attention from one thing to the other. Multitasking ability declines with age, sleep deprivation, and alcohol consumption. People who think they are multitasking often are completely unaware of what they, are, they have missed. Our brains are wired to focus on only one thing at a time, and that's what I just said. People can train uh, to pay extra attention to things that are important. And this is known as the cocktail party effect. In noisy places, the auditory car cortex boosts some sounds to help the brain prioritize what's important. That's the cocktail party effect. Anyway, we also talked about multitasking. Attention is necessary to reduce the volume of incoming information to a manageable level. Research suggests that the amount of information that gets through depends on what resources are free to analyze it. 
The key concept is whether filtering of incoming information is carried out uh, clearly uh, early or late in the uh, system. If the filtering is early, then the amount of incoming information that is processed is relatively low. If filtering is late, then more information gets through to receive further processing. Treisman in 1993 argued that selection could be early or late depending on the concurrent load on perception. When perceptual load is low, late selection can occur, but if perceptual load is high, selection will be early. Lavi in 1995 proposed that the ability to focus narrowly and exclusively on a target in visual search depends on the perceptual load or overall demand uh, on attention of the whole task. And so the whole idea is focus. When do you focus? If you focus early, then you, you're going to see what you want to see. If you're focusing late, then, you'll, uh, then you have too much information to process and you'll, you might potentially miss it. If sufficient resources are available, stimuli other than the target can't be processed. So depending on the demand or perceptual load of the overall task, more or less of the available information can be processed. Once processing resources are exhausted, selection will be required. It is worth emphasizing that the relationship between workload and, uh, and early or late filtering explains the finding that irrelevant distractors are more likely to have an effect when workload is low. Uh, so it's easy to concentrate when you've got a deadline and you got to get this done. Uh, but if uh, the deadline isn't uh, that close, uh, potentially all of a sudden you're, you're watching television or you're listening to a conversation or you're paying more attention to your music than you are to your homework. There is a large body of evidence suggesting that not all processes are are subject to the capacity limitations discussed so far, as some processes do not require higher level control. Such processes are referred to as automatic processes. To distinguish them from control processes that do uh, draw on central uh, resources. A two-process theory distinguishing uh, between automatic and control processing was proposed by Schifrin and Schneider in 1977. The exogenous and endogenous systems proposed by Posner in 1980 uh, could map onto the automatic and control processes respectively. So uh, what do we do that's automatic thinking, that's automatic attention? Uh, it has to do with driving. Uh, I drive a standard transmission vehicle and so I have to shift gears uh, to get up to speed. I have to shift gears. Uh, I don't usually think about it, I just do it. Uh, shifting gears is not the easiest thing in the world uh, because you have to push in on the clutch, you have to uh, accelerate a little bit, and you have to shift, uh, you have to use one of your hands. Because, because we live in the United States, we drive on the right side of the road, so uh, the driver's on the left hand of the car, so it's your right hand that's, that's shifting gears. So you have to push in on the clutch, accelerate, and shift gears with your right hand all at the same time. And you have to do this in conjunction so that the car doesn't jerk. Not the easiest thing in the world. <clears throat> a lot easier to drive an automatic transmission vehicle than you don't have to worry about what your left foot is doing or what your right hand is doing because you just accelerate and the, uh, and the car shifts gears on its own. Moores and De Hauer in 2006 proposed that automatic processes have four features. They are goal unrelated, they're unconscious, they're fast, and they're efficient. And if you think about driving, a lot of times you're thinking about something else. You're doing something else uh, while you're driving. Uh, it's automatic. It's uh, not really goal uh, related in that, yeah, sure, you want to get down the road, but something else is more important than, than uh paying attention to your driving. It's fairly unconscious, it's relatively fast, it's very fast, and it's very efficient because you do the same thing every time. They therefore place little or no demand on uh, attentional resources or capacity, and that's one of the reasons why you can multitask so easily when you're driving, if you're an experienced driver. If you're not an experienced driver, you really don't want all that uh, uh, 
attention taken away from what we're doing. Uh, Sailing and Phillips in 2007 found that the development of automatically involved uh, a shift in brain activity from cortical areas towards subcortical areas. In particular, Jansma et al. in 2001 showed using functional MRIs that during the development of automa automaticity, there is a reduction in activity in frontal areas associated with executive control. In other words, if it's automatic thinking, it moves from the front of your brain to the, to the sides and the backs of your brain. Why? Because you ne don't need to think about it. Now, this is, this is kind of interesting. Uh, Pre-training, you needed to think about something while you were doing it. And look at all the, look at uh, where all the uh, attention is. And this is, after, this is after you've been trained. Everything is natural and it moves farther and farther back. The utility of automatic processing is that it allows us to sidestep the limitation of our processing resources by running some tasks in the background without having to expend resources to control them. There is a disadvantage to having processes running automatically, and this is the same as the advantage. They are not under conscious control. While not needing conscious control makes automatic processes highly efficient, it also means that they cannot be easily stopped or modified. A classic demonstration of this issue with automatic processing is provided by the well-known Stroop effect. This is the Stroop effect. Uh, okay, test A, red. Uh, what you need to do is identify the color. Uh, so this, this is red, this is purple, this is blue, this is green. This is orange, this is green, red, orange, blue, purple, blue, green, purple, orange, red. Okay, the Stroop effect is where now we have to identify the color. And even though it's, it's red, we have to say blue. Wait a minute, we have to identify the color. Okay, uh, so uh, this is, we have to say red. Then we have to say purple. Then we have to say blue, orange, orange. Oops, I'm sorry. See, <laughs> because reading is automatic for us, uh, and because a reading is automatic, I got orange wrong, I, or actually I got green wrong because that's a green, that's green, but it says orange, and this one is is says purple, but uh, uh, it's orange. Okay, so you can see how diff this is the Stroop effect. Okay, uh, that. Uh, Automatic thinking takes over. Sometimes automatic thinking takes over. I mean, that's what happens with reading. The most parsimonious explanation for the Stroop effect is that it demonstrates a conflict between a control process, naming the ink color, and an automatic process, which is reading. When attempting to name the ink color, the automatically generated word response from reading the word is already active and different to the response required for the ink color creating a conflict and impairing performance. And this is the reason why it's so difficult to do, because we have, we have controlled thinking and automatic thinking going on at the same time. Uh, controlled processing and, and automatic processing going on at the same time. And the automatic processing, of course, takes control of what's going on. So, th so when we look at this, we're supposed to call it, say red, but since it says purple, and that's automatic, we're more likely to say purple than red. And this is orange. Or, oh, see, I, I did it again. <laughs> and that's the Stroop effect. It's really quite fascinating. Automatic processes underpin skilled performance. Skills can be cognitive, such as problem solving or perceptual uh, motor, motor, such as typing or a combination of both cognitive and perceptual motor, such as driving. In all cases, it is found that practice makes perfect. Newell and Rosenblum in 1981 showed that the learning curve for skill can be described by a power law. Although we never stop improving with practice, the initial rapid improvement gradually becomes less and less as we become more skilled. Okay, so the more you practice, the, the more perfect it becomes. And I don't know if this softball player was practicing trying to make the ball land in the same spot, but she was able to do it. She's got pretty good swings. 
And that's the end of the chapter. Kind of a fun chapter. I'm not sure what the next chapter is about. Um, I hope we got through this one better than we did the chapter two. Um, I'm not a cognitive psychologist, but by golly, some a lot of this makes sense. I've seen the Stroop test before, and we talked about I've talked about the Stroop test in years past, uh, but now it makes a lot of sense since we're talking about automatic processing and uh, controlled processing. Fascinating stuff. So I'll talk to you guys next week. We'll have more fun next week.